Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild Review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. With this video, I'll be reviewing the DM's Guild adventure, The Secrets of the Twisting Colossus, designed by Christian Toft Madsen for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your DM's Guild shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to my platinum patrons, Andrew, Brian, Richard, and Joe, and gold patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy and Yuma, Marcos David Vicente Gilberto, Sean, aka Cert2B, Adam, Dead Lizard Lounge, Lounge, and Alkshi. Thank you all very much for your support. There I am. So, Secrets of the Twisting Colossus is a fifth level adventure, and it's all puzzles. If you enjoy puzzles, you're going to like this adventure. If you don't, Probably not so much. I like puzzles. I like puzzle games a lot. And what really, what this really reminded me of is like Portal or Antichamber or games that are just literally pure puzzles. It's just you go room to room and you're solving puzzles and there may be some kind of overarching mystery about the whole thing, which this one definitely does. Uh, but it is literally just all puzzle solving, which is a part of D&D. Uh, it's not the only part of D&D, but it is one that I feel like does get the shaft in a lot of different adventures and dungeons are just good old-fashioned like adventure game style puzzles where you really have to figure things out. And then uh, the way D&D typically does it is a skill check is involved. Even once you figure it out, you know, there's a strength check or intelligence check or something. Um, but the players still have to logically come up with a way to solve that problem. And what this presents is a giant rotating maze of puzzle rooms, with each individual room having its own self-contained puzzle. And if you succeed, you get to go forward through the maze. If you fail, uh, not only do you not get to go forward, but the entire dungeon actually rotates uh, to where you might end up with different puzzle rooms that you need to solve. All of that is really, really clever and cool. The one main misgiving I have is that some of these puzzle designs are quite difficult and challenging even for me as a DM to read on like the descriptive text that I'm then supposed to read to the players sound a lot of them sound very overwhelming and confusing and trying to paint that kind of theater of the mind uh, picture now there are visual aids provided there are some um, not battle maps so much but again they're not really battling but there are some nice uh, Im images involved in getting the point across of what each room is all about but even with all of those I found some of them to be just a little bit overly challenging and complex than uh, what I was looking for. But overall, I think uh, it's a really solid adventure. If you're looking for something that is specifically all about puzzle designs, uh, with that kind of overarching story and theme, this one happens to involve a kind of mad alchemist uh, who's trying to uh, make this god potion or to transform himself into a godlike figure and the reason he has to capture heroes is because he needs to distill, you know, their heroic uh, essence or whatever bullshit narrative that we've concocted here. I'm being disparaging, but it, it works quite well, and I think that uh, the climax also works uh, really, really well and is a memorable and exciting climax, and it's that villain is kind of that classic taunting uh, villain where he can, uh, as a magic mouth appears, the end of every single puzzle, either you succeed or fail, and either taunts you or congratulates you or everything else. I like all of that involved very much. Uh, let's go over uh, step by step what Secrets of the Twisting Colossus is all about. It is divided into three chapters, uh, four chapters, sorry, the majority of which is that puzzle filled death trap maze. Um, the first one is a simple introduction that provides some adventure hooks. I do love an adventure that gives me multiple adventure hooks uh, that allow me to weave together this dungeon that you could plop into basically any campaign. And obviously a lot of the DMs Guild stuff, they know that what people are looking for is stuff that they can plop into their own campaign. They don't want to build a campaign necessarily around this adventure, although there is one interesting hook that you could use involving the plane of uh, Mechanus, which is actually really cool. But for the most part, uh, I think it's uh, pretty easy to drop this in anywhere. There's a you know a standard town you can go visit that will that's got NPCs that'll give you some hints about uh, what's going on. But uh, I, I like it when when we've got these uh, multiple options and these kind of NPCs that can uh, drive you to there. My favorite one is definitely one uh, that involves the 
Uh, the one NPC, Sekmasad, I think, uh, it has a sending stone that uh, the villain can actually speak to the heroes through. And I love that idea because I just love a constantly taunting, monologuing uh, villain. Because, again, in d d it's, it's very hard to make good villains because typically they don't... You know, in, in movies, you've got that scene of, like, just the villains. Well, in D&D, you, you almost never take the camera away from the player's lens. And unless you have a villain, like, literally just popping up and then teleporting away or something, it, it's hard to craft, you know, those good villain stories. So I think having that sending stone and being able to have that communication uh, is very cool. There's actually a sidebar here on the side uh, that is the difference between 5e versus old school, which is what the uh, author has put together. And that's a little unfair towards 5th edition because I feel like a lot of this stuff is, uh, like, it says you could forego wisdom, uh, perception, and investigation skill checks and instead just have players find that stuff when they notice that part of the environment. I think that's that should be pretty obvious. I, that's just kind of like general DM advice, I feel like. I don't know if that's necessarily something that's like 5e versus old school. Some of this stuff is designed to make things more difficult. So, for example, downgrade natural healing. Uh, in other words, take away the whole concept of a short rest. There are multiple instances you can gain a long rest in this dungeon, which is um, smart balancing, I think. Uh, all chambers are pitch dark. There's different things you can use to make it more challenging. And I get that. Like, 5e is definitely easier and more streamlined in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I feel like just general DM advice is, like, if your players can notice something, then maybe they don't need to do a skill check for it. That's the case for, honestly, anything. If you want your players to do something, you know, the advice is, if you want, if you don't want your players to have a chance of, you know, success or failure, then don't make them roll that check. (laughs) So if you want your players to do something, you want to reward your players for role-playing really well or solving a puzzle really well, then don't have them roll the check because then they have a chance of failure and then they're like, that's just, you can watch their player's face just deflate when they do things, when they do everything right, but then the dice just doesn't go their way. So I think that's good general advice to have is that, hey, if they manage to do things well. Now, if it's still something like you need to, you know, you figured out you need to turn this wheel, but you still have to turn this very hard wheel that is a strength check, then that's different. You're not really, um, you know, I I can see why that still involves you having to make that check. Oops. Uh, Anyway, let's move on. So chapter two is the standard. And you can see chapter one and chapter two are just both two pages each. Very, very short. The majority of this whole adventure is in chapter three. Chapter two is just the standard, very standard uh, village the party goes to. Uh, It is right next to these giant, this really cool, like, alien structure of these two twin towers that are, um, I guess they're not helix with each other. They're just kind of next to each other, but they've got this uh, cog that allows this... um, cog to rotate in between the towers so rooms are actually shifting and then beneath the towers uh, the whole thing actually rotates in fact let's actually jump down to the map um, because I think that gives a proper here we go so this map one provides a really really useful I was completely lost in this adventure until uh, I realized that these maps were included at the end and I don't know if um, I don't think they're included in these separate uh, picture handouts here. I think these are just the kind of mist style pictures, which are very cool. I'll get to those in a second. Uh, but this is the key. If the, if this adventure didn't have this map, I would not... I would have been completely lost on a lot of things. And I'm a pretty smart person, I feel like, you know, and I feel like a lot of people that uh, play and consume and run, you know, anything involved in tabletop RPGs tend to be on the above average intelligent scale, I, I would surmise. Uh, but there were a lot of puzzles in here that confused the shit out of me and just based on pure uh, written description. And having these visual uh, aids, including the side view right here and then the top-down view uh, here, helped immensely. So you can see here, this is the way uh, the side view of the actual towers here. This maze is on the bottom, and then these little hex rooms, which each one of these is a different puzzle room. Uh, they Actually, the outer chamber here rotates uh, I believe counterclockwise uh, if the players fail. And you can see there's the maze here. And this this stuff I could understand a lot better. This this made a lot more sense to me than trying to just read everything that happened. There's a really cool system where every single doorway uh, can open um, to the next chamber. But if you fail, then you go into the inner chamber and essentially have to solve a different puzzle, which is really clever. Like failure, it, it, how do you handle having puzzle rooms with a binary success-fail state? You know, if failure, do they just take damage and they have to keep solving it and they eventually get stuck? No, the answer is they just go into essentially the loser's bracket <laughs> of the uh, 
inner chamber and they have to solve another puzzle. Now, if they fail in there, uh, then the entire thing rotates and then a door opens up, which as a DM, I would use that as an excuse to then, okay, well, you get to try a different puzzle now and succeed or fail on that one. And then I can definitely see a problem where if players just continuously fail over and over again, that could be a serious problem because then they won't ever make any more uh, progress. So hopefully they would succeed on at least some of these. I do feel like not all of them are horribly, like, you know, complex and uh, difficult to describe or see what's going on. And there's some differences in them, and we'll get to that in a second. But this visual aid, and the reason I'm looking at this for so long is because it's so much more helpful than trying to read. My only main complaint about the organization is I wish that these little top-down room things were more prevalent in the actual written text. Instead, we get those um, big black and white uh, pictures, which are in the separate handout for all the rooms, which that's kind of nice to have, but just having that kind of top-down uh, little hex thing would have been really useful to have. Also, just more visual aids in general, I think, would have been helpful. Um, so, yeah, Chapter 2, they just meet a few NPCs. They learn that there are some missing people that have gone into the... Uh, the Twisting Colossus. Uh, the main plot that the players get is that there is this uh, alchemist who is in this Twisting Colossus um, uh, tower, and he's up to no good, and the players need to go there and figure it out. Or you can use different adventure hooks. There was one that's like, hey, just go into this you know, cool big alien structure from the Plane of Mechanus that's dropped off in our world and loot it. And that's basically the only plot hook. So it just kind of depends on what your players' attitudes are and what needs should be met. You can use different adventure hooks. Chapter 3 is the maze itself. And you notice that the maze was just the bottom part of this entire dungeon, but it is still the majority of this dungeon. Um, there's a nice uh, write-up here about guidelines for the maze, how everything works. I mean, it's very, very detailed. Uh, it's There's a lot of information here. I never feel like there was not enough information, but there's just a lot going on. It's a very, very complex dungeon that really requires the DM to sit here and pour over these notes and make sure they understand what's going on. I feel like the information presented here was very good, but there were times when my eyes were just glazing over to be honest. Like there are some of these as some of these traps in particular were just felt like they were overwhelmingly difficult for even me to understand, let alone players who are going to be way lost compared to me. And I really felt sorry for them in some of these situations about how the hell are they supposed to figure out what's going on. And there are some nice little notes here. They can find objects in some of the chambers in Appendix B, which are very, very uh, low-level magic items specifically designed to help them with certain puzzles, which reminded me a lot of like old school adventure games where it was all inventory based puzzles and you could find, you know, some object and use that in a different setting. That's definitely what this reminded me of and I liked that a lot. Uh, like a tube of air that gives you some water breathing could obviously help in a lot of these water based puzzles. Um, uh, there's one of them that lets you uh, communicate through walls and there's of course a, at least one puzzle room that has walls shoot up and section off, in theory, she sectioning off players from each other and they're all supposed to put in you know, certain things into certain places. Very escape room style shit basically. Um, there's a bunch of Modrons around which is really fun because they're not really designed for combat encounters at all, which I think is cool. They're just kind of neutral, um, mostly neutral parties, but the players, if they reach like that certain place in the dungeon, they could even talk to the Modrons and possibly even like ally with them or some kind of role playing could be cool. Uh, my only bummer is that none of those notes are really provided here in terms of like possible dialogue or anything there would have been really fun. Like how do you actually role play Modrons and that kind of stuff. I've never used Modrons before. I've never seen anybody use Modrons before. I think it's a really neat idea that I just, they're always so under you. There's such an interesting concept for a monster design. Um, basically little robots that are just, seem like very kind of Alice in Wonderland-ish where it's just very otherworldly and strange uh, and I really like seeing them here I wish there was more on the Modrons frankly because um, I think it's, it's a neat part of this dungeon and the way the maze works is it's designed to uh, it's not just there for like a Tomb of Horror style like shits and giggles uh, which is totally what a Serac does to heroes, instead this uh, mad alchemist um, I don't remember his name, Perak Pericles or something <laughs> Uh, is literally trying to distill like heroic essence from heroes. And to do that, he needs to test the heroes uh, by putting through all these different trials. And each trial is meant to break down different pieces of the alchemical process. And this actually looks like kind of a way of like medieval-style uh, alchemy, which is kind of neat. So if anybody's into that, that could be you know dissolution, separation, conjunction... All that stuff sounds very cool. I don't know if that's literally bullshitting or if it's, it is drawn from that. It sounds like it's drawn from like you know, some kind of real-world basis in terms of at least 
uh, what maybe alchemy was thought of at one point. Uh, but I think that's a cool thing. Uh, the scribbles here are basically clues and notes that players can find. This reminded me a lot of a Serax riddles you can find in the Tomb of Horrors or Tomb of Annihilation um, to help players like understand and give clues to different chambers. And that's extremely important because a lot of these can be very, very difficult. So I do think this is a great addition, which I, if I was the DM, I would definitely include these here. And they're all like, basically, and it says position for novice players. Man... Maybe I maybe I underestimate players too much, but I think that with puzzles also, it's just a crapshoot. Sometimes I think players will pick that up just instantly, and you'll be like, "Oh man, you figured it out." And other times, you know, it's the big it's the trouble with the DM is you 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 have all the information on your side, but you don't know what the players are going to think is really hard and what the players are going to think is really easy. And I think giving them all these different clues will help hopefully even the playing field there. Like I'm okay with a puzzle being uh, too easy and, and letting the players have that feeling of like, "Oh man, we did it. That was an easy one." rather than frustrating players with a really challenging puzzle that they really see no way of being able to handle. And meanwhile, every single one of these puzzles is damaging the heroes constantly, which is terrifying. <laughs> Again, maybe I just underestimate players. Um, and you can see here's a breakdown of how the maze works, how the different chambers open and close. I totally understood that part now that I had all these visual aids, which was very nice. And again, I saw that map on the bottom. So you can see at the entry point, you can either go into room one or room 10. And then from there, the doors close. You have to do the trap. When the trap ends, if you succeeded it, then the next one to the blue chamber opens. If you failed, then the door to the inner orange chamber opens. And then from there, you have to succeed or fail there. And if you succeed, you either go to one of the next orange chambers, or if you fail, you have to go backwards uh, out of one of the four openings from the A chamber. But meanwhile, that uh, the entire thing is rotated, and you hear those grinding gears and everything, so the players could end up, you know, failing A again, so, that, you know, they failed twice over, but then they might end up in a different room than before, and I think that's the idea, is they, that we're just not repeating the same puzzles over and over again, and the nice thing is, at the end, there's an appendix full of about another, you see here, there are ten different puzzle rooms, and the appendix includes, I think, another four or five puzzle rooms that you could substitute in any of these rooms. So there are plenty of puzzle opportunities. If you, as a DM, do not like one of these, or if you notice that the players didn't really like one at all, and they failed it, and now you're thinking, okay, well, let's just spit them out into one of these other rooms instead, that possibility is there, and that's really, really cool, and I think that's the key to making this adventure work, is that it's not excessively linear to where it's not just like one chamber after the other. It's like, okay, you've got all these branching paths that depend on success or failure. Now, bare minimum, the players, I believe, have to do five of these. If you look at this map, assuming they succeed in every single one of them, they could just go one, two, three, four, five, and then make it to the exit, and then they're done. And then worst case scenario, obviously, they just never make it out of A, and they just keep failing, popping in, and failing, popping in. And that's that would be a big bummer. So hopefully you're not running this adventure at all unless your players are at least you know positive on puzzles <laughs> you're really you got to know your players ahead of time and realize that um i'm not going to go through every single puzzle um but we can go through a little bit of how it's organized there is a little bit of a this is a neat idea it's it's a little black and white picture of every single puzzle room which is nice but it's also still kind of difficult to see what the hell is going on. And there is a handout, uh, a separate handout that offers a bigger picture. And this really reminded me of like an old school uh, mist game or something. Um, I guess uh, a Portal would be the more equivalent. Honestly, I was reminded of Saw in a lot of these cases in terms of how each one of these traps is designed to fucking, you know, kill people. And you find like corpses in a couple of these areas. You find like, you know, charred bodies or something. And that was... Reminded me very much of, like, the Saw movies, or at least the early ones. I don't know if the later ones kept up with the Death Trap dungeon thing, which is basically what the Saw shit is. Um, some of these just work better than others. Some of them are a little more obvious than others. It also reminds me of the Zelda shrines in Breath of the Wild, very much so, where each room is just one puzzle you have to figure out. Uh, Leap of Faith involves... Um, it's, a, it's just a, a giant pond, like, in the middle of the room, and as soon as you hit the water, the ceiling crushes down on anybody um leaving you with no ability to get back up out of the water and then you have to go down and like pull this ring uh, but meanwhile there's these tentacles underwater that grab a hold of you uh i think the only way this one damages you is if you drown and it would have been nice to have like drowning rules um put in here because i remember in 
after one of our campaign, after something happened in our campaign, I actually revisited the drowning rules because they didn't seem very exciting for round to round combat. It just feels like everybody could hold their breath for you know minutes at a time, and given that combat lasts six seconds, it doesn't seem like drowning ever matters in combat. So I think you'd need to do some kind of house rule for that, just as a note. Um, some of these just felt a little too uh, confusing, like I was reading an SAT question, for example. God, this one still confused the hell out of me. Mirror, mirror on the wall. It's got two chambers on either side. Um, it's got a plaque, but the plaque is sort of a lie in terms of players are supposed to run towards one of the chambers um, as fast as you can, one at a time, but that part doesn't really matter, it turns out. And then these panels open, this mirror flashes and confuses everybody, or does short-term madness. And then you're still supposed to make it through the other side. I, I was very confused on how that one particularly worked. Um, Suffering Breeze Resistance is a sloped chamber that as soon as you reach the middle, uh, a bunch of spores come out and essentially make it so you're either paralyzed or you fight each other. And the puzzle isn't solved unless blood is spilled uh, through, like, gaps in the bottoms. The idea is the players are supposed to fight each other. There is not a lot of combat here, by the way. You occasionally have, like, one that the water, like, fills up in a chamber. There might be a swarm of quippers there. And there was another one... Um, there's like a gas-filled chamber that kind of disorients you, and you're supposed to do this kind of touchy-feely puzzle while the gas is filling up, and like the swarm of ins uh, bees, I think, comes and attacks you. Very, very little combat, though, whatsoever. I would have, frankly, I don't think I've ever said this before in an adventure, like to see a little bit more combat. I want to see that balanced a little better. I mean, think about even the Zelda shrines, which were however many of those, 80 or 100 or something, in Breath of the Wild, some of them were just pure combat related. It was just like, you you know, you and the little guardian thing or something. And that helped break it up. Like, they don't all have to be like these super complex uh, puzzle designs involving putting weight on platforms or having all these traps, you know. Just have it be like there's this, I don't know, identical clone of all the players like appears as robots and you have to fight them or you know, some kind of mechanical thing and it's the test of will. I, I don't know. Something where you can do just a straight up more like a combat because at that point, and usually it's a, usually it's the puzzle that breaks up all the combat in a dungeon. I, I'm looking for a combat encounter that breaks up all the puzzles in this dungeon. So I realize the irony there, but still, that's something I could look for. Um, this is okay. I'm gonna read you the description of this one because this one just absolutely went over my head. At each wall are elevated platforms raised one inch from the floor. The platforms are in diagonally opposite to each other. Central on the black and four is a small frame containing indistinct gray blocks. The lower right corner of the frame is painted red, and the left top corner contains a single red block. Within the matrix of blocks is an open vacant position. Around the central frame are iron manacles fastened from the stone floor. Scattered on the floor are piles of ash which appear to have been swept together. Seemingly confirming this point, a broom can be seen laying on one of the platforms. Leaning up against the wall is a set of woolen boots. That sounds like a goddamn SAT question that's like... Okay, now, how? what color were the blocks? Or, you know, it's just, like, way too much detail there of shit that's not important versus what is important. And maybe that's part of the idea is that players are... You, you give them all these descriptions, and the players have to, like, painstakingly inspect what the hell everything is, what the puzzle area is, and all of that. The problem is, this is not an adventure, of, an adventure video game where you have all these things on the screen and you can sit there and analyze and everything. This is all theater of the mind shit where you're just supposed to, you know, the DM has to constantly be reminding players, but okay, what did I see? What was the thing over there? What was that? I just don't think that quite works. That design doesn't quite work as well in D&D versus in, like an adventure video game. And, and this did say it came with maps for like Fantasy Ground and, and Roll20. I have not seen those maps. Um... Maybe that solves a lot of the problems here, but I have a feeling it's mainly just these handouts for visual aids, and they do a, a fine job. It's better than nothing. I think it's uh, really interesting to give the players these kind of aids, you know, rather than some kind of battle map, because this is a puzzle room, and you don't really need a battle map here. But some of the description is is, is just frighteningly overwhelming in terms of uh, I don't know how players determine what they need to be doing in any one of these chambers. I'm frankly confused on, on some of these. I It still confuses me. I think this is some kind of sliding block puzzle here where they have to uh, move that one red brick to the red side, but it doesn't start until they activate all these uh, platforms in, in the corner. I, I, don't, I don't know. That one... A couple of these puzzles have just completely lost me. <laughs> it's just completely lost. Some of them I understand very, very easily. Like the one with the spores coming down, I get that one. The one with the ceiling coming down when they hit the water, that's fine, although it seems like every player would just be able to jump across the water, but I get that the door still doesn't open until you hit the water. Um, the uh, 
let's see, there was one that, okay, this one was a very easy one that I understood right away. This feels like I've seen this in a lot of video games. Uh, the chamber number six. It's this um, wall that bisects the, this chamber, and then it's, it, it uh, is electrified, and it just starts rotating at a pretty constant speed. So immediately, everybody has to just run to keep ahead of it. Like, it just, you know, does this turning around and all the players have to and it said and this is really clever because I think it uses the D&D system very well all the players have to spend an action doing dash and if they do that then they can easily keep ahead of the wall the problem is in order to actually solve this puzzle they have to uh, raise or lower whatever uh, levers that are on the floor and of course if they stop to do a lever uh, they're gonna hit by this thing and get knocked on the ground now the nice thing is it's not flush with the ground so if they're knocked down it goes over their head um, which I don't see why somebody couldn't just kind of army crawl their way on the ground. I didn't see anything about that, but um, I guess there's... Yeah, it, doesn't, it just says in order to move, they have to just get up and dash again. But I like the idea there. That's more of a you know purely dexterity-based, everybody can immediately understand just by looking at things, okay, what do I have to do? And it's more of an exciting, rather than a sit there and figure it out thing, it's more of an exciting. And that's the nice thing is the puzzles are a lot of variety there, and it breaks things up quite a bit. And But just some of them that were a little more involved with like mixing liquids together or inserting things into places or like putting weight onto pillar those i was a little less uh enthused about and some of them very much felt like tomb of horrors um not necessarily in a bad way like the uh let's see there and back again one of the inner chambers has a uh pillar in the middle of this like lava pit with a button on top and there's a single bridge going there and with the players run halfway across the bridge they are teleported to one of these little like ledges down there in the pit that they have to then climb out of and then the lava starts to rise um that's pretty smart i feel like a lot of players would immediately figure out okay well that bridge is probably not safe or something's up and sure enough there's like a hidden bridge on the left side that one i could also understand as being okay here's everybody can figure it out i would say the mix is maybe half and half with puzzles that you can kind of instantly determine what the problem is and how to solve it but still requires like you know a check that makes sense versus puzzles that are not immediately intuitive and uh instead require some logical leaps for the players to figure out and then about half of those involve uh you know immediate environmental danger around them that the players have to deal with versus i think actually pretty much all of them involve like just constant damage being done to the players which is why I'm a little worried because some of them just feel overly damaging and punishing and cruel, even while the players are still trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. <laughs> so hopefully nobody nobody gets killed here because I don't think that's necessarily fun. But um, it, I, I, it, some of them just feel a little bit overly complex and difficult for uh, for D and D purposes. Whereas I think they would work very well for if you were designing this as a visual video game where you could see everything pretty clearly and react to things. Uh, pretty clearly, but I do love that they are extra uh, ones at the bottom uh, that you can replace any of these with. Um, there is one extra section here where if they go up into the tower from the uh, from I believe uh, area D, uh, where the Modrons hang out, there's a whole section where um, the Modrons kind of keep everything running, which is kind of cool, and you can see it actually rotates uh, in itself. And when they finally get to the end, this is also a re really cool feature of this dungeon. Uh, players are transported to the top laboratory uh, where our evil alchemist hangs out and they are shrunk into little itty bitty uh, size and uh, they are teleported inside literal like beakers and flasks I believe there's a map here this is the, the side view map of the players as well as a top down one thank you so much for including these visual aids I love these to death um, even though I wouldn't necessarily use these as actual battle maps, but uh, they're very helpful for me to understand what's going on. Um, and the players then have to escape from these beakers as like water fills up, and then they start to heat, and then they get bubbled over to the other side. There's all these different rules for all these different uh, chambers of uh, here. You can see, look at this process goes over round one, two, three, four, and it literally goes through all the alchemo, uh, the alchemy process, and it involves these different strength checks and all these things to try to escape. Um, anybody that has Misty Step is going to be laughing and mocking the rest of the players because they can just teleport out, which is going to be a huge advantage. Um, but I think this is a really fun, memorable moment. Um, after all of that, they're given this really difficult situation. There's a bunch of flesh golems in there. Uh, there's a pool of liquid from failed alchemy experiments that can transform different parts of the players, kind of the way um, I think it's the Alter Self spell does. It gives them eagle wings or the head of a shark, which is pretty hilarious. Uh, that's a really cool effect. I like that a lot. 
They can make potions, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, the uh, final showdown with the alchemist. And it it mentions... <laughs> I've seen this a lot of DMs Guild, too. They're like, this boss fight is really fucking hard. I get it. Y'all like making really, really hard boss fights. Um, a potentially very dangerous encounter. Depend on the status of the characters. I do appreciate there's a sidebar here that makes it both uh, easier and more difficult depending on how basically your players have done the previous adventure. Are they, you know, out of spell slots? Have they gone through a lot of their hit dice? Are they just really low? Then you probably need to err on the side of caution. Meanwhile, have they just been able to get a long rest recently? Were they kind of flying through the adventure and solving puzzles left and right? Then you might be able to step up the difficulty uh, quite a bit, which is which is pretty fun. There's role-playing notes. You can make him more of a uh, addict than evil, so he just needs to make that god potion, so maybe he's more sympathetic, which is kind of cool. Um, I like that a lot, but I think this could be a very memorable encounter. Just that initial, like, plop into the uh, beaker when you realize everything you've been doing has been, like, essentially going through these motions of testing different alchemy processes and then have that process, like, actually happen to the players while they're inside a literally, like, Bunsen burner-style setup I think is, is really cool and memorable. And I like that uh, quite a bit. Uh, the last little bits just has the maps we've obviously seen a lot of. Uh, the appendix, there's only the one. Um, I mean, there's there's hardly any enemies in here at all. There's Modrons. You're not meant to fight them. And otherwise, there's just like one or two little swarms of insects or something. Very, very little combat. So the main combat is against uh, Paracallus, that's his name, at the end. Uh, CR8 Mage, uh, as well as I believe he's got some flesh golems with him. Um, the magic items, which I mentioned, are all very nice kind of adventure game style items that help you uh, solve different puzzles specifically within these chambers, which I think is really cool. And then the additional chambers, let's see how many are there. One, two, three, four, five. There are five additional chambers in addition to the ten that are uh, as written. So 15 total puzzle rooms, which is really kind of interesting. And frankly, if you're just looking for an interesting uh supplement of puzzles to like include in a dungeon this could be useful for that even if you're not going to run this adventure as written you could use this as a resource for really clever kind of zelda shrine style puzzles because there's just a lot of really good ones here now some of them as i said are very complex and confusing but maybe i'm just being stupid and maybe you'll immediately glom onto that and and that makes more sense to you and maybe your players uh, are particularly into those kind of puzzles so you'll be able to see you know which ones are going to work and which ones won't but i guarantee you i guarantee you you'll be able to find at least a couple puzzles in here that you'll be like oh man this is a really neat idea maybe i should just drop this into my dungeon that i'm creating if you don't want to run this one although i think this one is uh definitely worth running let's go over my pros and cons for the secrets of the twisting colossus uh, pro, it has over a dozen intriguing complex trap rooms with helpful maps and visual aids. There's just a lot of really solid content here, and I like the fact that they were all given um, little black and white photos of, like, almost looks like a, like a screenshot if this were a video game, uh, as well as that really, really helpful map one and map two that had the side view as well as all the kind of hex grid maps. Those were uh, absolutely critical. Uh, the trap uh, pro the trap room maze is cleverly non-linear including rotating rooms and multiple doors and pads i like that if you fail you don't you don't you're not like given a hard stop if you fail and have to keep retrying the puzzle instead you're given basically one chance to succeed or fail i think it gives you like maybe two or three rounds or something um and then if you fail it just opens up a different path i thought that was a really really clever way of handling uh failure uh, which I always like to see in D&D. You don't want to ever have your players go down, uh, you know, there. there's no game over in D&D. There's no reload like there is in video games. So you have to just have it be where uh, failure just leads to a different kind of outcome, a different kind of uh, adventure or sub-adventure or something. And that's something that uh, I like to see uh, DMs Guild adventures do is they have these other outcomes happen if players don't have the desired outcome the first time. Uh, Pro, I think it has a very memorable climax involving shrunken heroes in alchemy beakers and a mad scientist. Uh, that's just really cool. When they finally make it out of there, they teleport into these shrunken uh, alchemy setup, and like literally all those things start happening to them. And they have to figure out a way to get out of there, uh, get themselves back to normal size, probably fight those flesh golems, and then uh, battle the uh, mad alchemist at the end. 
Pro Modrons could make for some fun, friendly NPCs, and Paracallus is a classic Mad Mage style taunting villain. Very, very few NPCs in this adventure, but I think the ones that are included um, are very well done. I, I just love to see Modrons here. I don't, I don't get enough Modrons, and I think that uh, having this be literally a um, cast off section of the uh, what do they call it, Plain of Mechanus, Mechanus. Uh, with a bunch of Modrons that are trying to get back home. That can be this whole side story. You can even uh, recruit. I think that would be a really fun system is if the players do meet the Modrons, they convince them to uh, help them f in their fight against the Alchemist, and that is as uh, written in part of the adventure as, as a possible outcome. Uh, that could be even a bigger, more exciting final battle is if the Modrons suddenly swarm up while you're fighting uh, and help you in that fight, which would be really cool. And I like that Paracallus can be used as a uh, just kind of taunting, insane villain. is always fun. Cons, uh, many of the puzzles and traps are excessively complex and very punishing. I just feel like a, a, there was a few of them. It wasn't, I said many. I'd probably change that to some. Some of the puzzles and traps are excessively complex and very punishing. Um, there was a few of them that I just still did not understand. Like, I read through them three or four times. And I don't know if it was any, it wasn't like it was badly written or anything. It's all very well detailed and all of that is there. I just feel like it was just too much for me to try to picture in a theater of the mind setup. Uh, you know, if this were like a video game and I had that visual aid, then I could probably work my way into what I needed to do. But just trying to do that as a DM reading it and then trying to think about how I impart that knowledge on players uh, felt very, very difficult to do on some of these puzzles. And all of them are, are very punishing for the most part. They are doing like constant damage to heroes. So it is, if the players aren't figuring things out very quickly, it can, it seems like it would be quite punishing. Uh, my other con is that the entire dungeon is basically a series of puzzles with almost no combat and very little role-playing. And that's very unusual, which I hesitate to put that as a con because it is nice to have a dungeon that's basically all puzzles. But on the other hand, it's it's a dungeon that's almost all puzzles. Like there's, I would have loved if there were just at least one NPC the players... I guess there's the Modrons, but... Like, if one of those dead NPCs the players found was actually still alive and just really hurt, and maybe they could help with some of the puzzles, or, you know, they're just there to, I don't know, provide some uh, pathos with the players. Um, but otherwise, if they don't interact with the Modrons, then you basically just have the boss at the end in terms of role-playing, and that's not going to be much of a role-playing situation. It's basically just a boss fight. And combat, especially, is basically non-existent until that final boss fight. So just be aware it's very very heavy on the puzzles uh final verdict for the secrets of the twisting colossus if you're looking for a truly puzzling death trap dungeon that invokes the portal games the saw movies and D's own tomb of horrors check out the uniquely rotating puzzle rooms within the secrets of the twisting colossus thank you everyone for watching this video review you can see my written review at roguewatson.com you can support my work at patreon.com roguewatson and you can follow our own D&D &D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.